Welcome to session five of the Lighthouse Harbor Church membership class. This session is called Our Practices. We're going to talk about three things that we do in particular and how we do those things particularly here at Lighthouse Harbor Church. The first is baptism then the Lord's Supper, and then we'll run through what's called church discipline. So the first, baptism. Let's talk through what baptism is, why you should be baptized, who should be baptized, those kind of things. Let's start with this. Why should you be baptized? Why should you be baptized? I hear people say sometimes, well, you know, baptism isn't necessary for salvation. It's just this old thing. Why do we need to do it at all? A couple of reasons. The first one is this. Number one, to follow the example set by Jesus. To follow the example set by Jesus. Mark 1, nine says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Jesus did it. We should too. Number two, because Jesus commands it. Jesus commands it. He tells us to do this and to baptize other people in Matthew 28, 19-20. He says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is part of discipleship. Here's number three. It shows the world that you're a believer. It shows the world that you're a believer. Acts 18, 8 says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Crispus, being the ruler of the synagogue, this was a big deal for him to go out and publicly declare that he was now a follower of Jesus. That made a huge public statement. And so, baptism is part of showing the world that you're a believer. Here's the next question. What does baptism mean? What does baptism mean? That's a question I hear often. And this is one of those things that sets us apart as Baptists. Baptism means two things in particular. One is it illustrates Jesus' burial and resurrection. It illustrates Jesus' burial and resurrection. That's why we baptize by immersion. We put people all the way in. We pull them all the way out. Because it, it illustrates this death and dying and rising with Jesus. Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Again, sort of identification with Christ, this thing that is a symbol and a recognition and a, a sign of dying and rising with Jesus. Here's number two. It illustrates your new life as a Christian. It illustrates your new life as a Christian. Romans 6, 4 says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So again, it shows this like washing off of sin, this dying with Christ, this being raised again so that we walk in a new, washed, cleansed way of life. Okay, so again, I said there there is a... A way that baptism sets us apart as Baptists, which is what we are. And a big part of that is that we baptize by immersion. That means all the way in, all the way out. Here are four reasons why you should be baptized by immersion. Number one, because Jesus was baptized that way. Because Jesus was baptized that way. Matthew 3.16 says, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened. And so on and so forth. But this idea that he was in the water. He had to come up from the water. Not just that they went into the water to sprinkle him, but the idea was that they would go to a large body of water big enough that you could dump somebody in it. Because that's the idea of baptism. And so Jesus was baptized that way. Number two, every baptism recorded in the Bible was by immersion. Here's a good example of this. Um, Paul with the Ethiopian eunuch, he leads this man to Christ on the side of the road. And it says, Acts 8, 38-39, He commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Philip, excuse me, I said Paul, but Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. So again, this idea of coming up out of the water. They went down into the water, he baptized him, and then they came up out of the water. If this was a pouring, if this was a sprinkling, there's no need to go down into the water, but that's what they did. Here's another one, number three. The Greek word translated baptize is baptizo, and it means to dip underwater. And we pull our, our word baptize directly from the Greek, and that word is baptizo, and it means to immerse something in water, to dip it in, to put it all the way in. And number four, one of the big reasons that we baptize by immersion is it best symbolizes burial and resurrection. 
Number four, it best symbolizes burial and resurrection. Romans 6, 4 says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So again, like I mentioned earlier, it's the picture of dying with Christ, rising with him. The sprinkling, the, the pouring, they just don't capture that in the same way. And I think that's why Jesus commanded us to be baptized and to be baptized by immersion. So lastly, who should be baptized? And this is an easy one. Number one, only one, every person who has believed on Christ. Every person who has believed on Christ should be baptized. Here's some examples from Scripture. Acts 2.41, at Pentecost, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So everybody who received the word, in other words, believed the gospel, they were baptized. 3,000 people, that's a lot of baptisms in one day. And then Acts 8.12, again, Philip is preaching in another place, and when he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. There's no situation in Scripture where someone is baptized without believing. And so I think every believer should be baptized, but only those who believe should be baptized. That's, that's one of the things that sets us apart as a Baptist church here. Sometimes people wonder about kids. What do we do with kids? Well, we don't baptize babies because we only baptize believers. But we do baptize kids when they're ready. And so part of that is that we wait until our kids are old enough to fully understand baptism and are able to fully express the significance of their faith in Christ before being baptized. And this is different for every kid, but we would rather wait too long than baptize too quickly. That's sort of the way that we think about it. Some churches practice infant baptism or a baptism of confirmation for kids. And this is intended to be a covenant between parents and God. And there's a reason that they do that. That's like the Presbyterians, um, Lutherans, some other denominations practice this idea of infant baptism. But we don't. Because this is different from the baptism that we think is described in the Bible. Which was only for those old enough to believe. And the purpose is to publicly confess your personal commitment to Christ and your entrance into his body and into this new covenant. And babies can't do that. And so we don't baptize babies. Last thing I do want to say before we move on from baptism. We do require every member to be baptized or to have been baptized by immersion before becoming a member of the church, as Jesus taught. And so if you've already been baptized, praise God, we're not going to make you do it again. But if you haven't been baptized by immersion, if you were baptized as a baby, or if you feel like you were baptized before you really understood what you were doing, then that's a conversation that we would have before you join the church because we are a community of baptized believers. That's part of what we do. And that lack of baptism will not keep you from joining the church. We just want you to be baptized the right way. So that's baptism. That's what sets us apart. Here's another way that we're different from some other churches, and that is the Lord's Supper. Every church does this a little bit differently. But we do the Lord's Supper in a particular way, and we'll talk about what that looks like. First of all, what is the Lord's Supper? What is the Lord's Supper? Well, it is a simple meal consisting of bread and grape juice. It's the first one. It's a simple meal consisting of bread and grape juice. Some churches use wine. We choose not to do that because we have a lot of people who have been alcoholics in their past and who are tempted by alcohol in certain ways, and we don't want the Lord's Supper to be a temptation for them. Here's how the Apostle Paul describes the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it's a simple meal consisting of bread and grape juice. But also, number two, it's a reminder of Jesus' death for us. We also see that in this passage. It's a reminder of Jesus' death for us. Do this in remembrance of me. So that as often as we take the bread and drink the juice or the wine, we remember that Jesus died to set us free. 
Number three, it's a symbol of Jesus' broken body and shed blood. It is a symbol of Jesus' broken body and shed blood. Again, he takes this bread and he says, this is my body broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. And neither of those are literal statements. It's like when Jesus said, I am the door and no one enters except through me. He wasn't literally saying, I'm an actual door. He's saying metaphorically, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so in the same way, he says, this is my body, this is my blood. These are symbols of Jesus' real broken body and real shed blood for us. And I think it serves as this touch point for us that Jesus died in a real way. This was not pretend, this was not myth, this is not just a nice idea. It was a reality, a real event that happened in history, that he died. His body was broken, his blood was shed for us. And then lastly, number four, it is a statement it is a statement of our faith in Jesus. Again, he says we, every time we drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This sort of semi-public thing that we do in church as, a, as the family of God, we're showing each other that we believe in Jesus. We're reminding each other that we believe in Jesus. We're reminding those and, and teaching those who aren't believers who are there with us that we believe in Jesus and that we are whole because his body was broken for us. So then lastly, no, excuse me, not lastly, who should take the Lord's Supper? Who should take the Lord's Supper? That's a question that is important to answer. And again, we believe only believers, only believers. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29 says, Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's a reference to the Lord's Supper. And he goes on to say that some of them have been doing it in an unworthy way. And so therefore, some of them have died and gotten sick. And so we reserve this only for believers. You have to be a believer in Christ to take the supper with us. You don't have to be a member. We don't require that. You don't even have to be baptized. We don't require that to take the Lord's Supper. But we do encourage you and ask that you search your heart before you take it with us. So we only allow believers to take the Lord's Supper. The last one is when and how often should we observe the Lord's Supper? And we don't we don't have uh, a set time in the Bible. That's the blanks there. Jesus never commanded any particular time or frequency. Jesus never commanded any particular time or frequency. And so as a church, we tend to take it two different times. We always take the Lord's Supper at our members' meetings. I found that that's just this fantastic time where it's just the members of the church, just those who are committed and accountable to each other. And it's something really special about all taking that Lord's Supper together in that time. It also sets the tone for those meetings so that we remember right off the bat, hey, we're here for Jesus, not for anything else. But then we also do it every other week at our Sunday services, and we incorporate that so that it doesn't become this rote thing that we do weekly. It has a specialness to it still, but so that we also are doing it often. I grew up in churches where sometimes we'd do it once a quarter, once every six months, and so that was something that I carried into my ministry here. And I realized pretty quickly, that's not enough. It's not enough. And it's been a real blessing, at least to me and I think to the people of our church, that we do this more often. So we try to do it every other week as a part of our regular Sunday morning services. Okay, so that's baptism. That's the Lord's Supper. And then here's one last one. This is a really important practice that has been kind of lost in a lot of churches. And praise God, we haven't had to do this very often. But that is church discipline. Church discipline. Now, this was an, it's an ancient practice. It's found in scripture. We're going to read a couple of scriptures that demonstrate this. But it's the, essentially the way of solving conflict within the church. And not just solving conflict. Like we can solve conflict at a low level by forgiveness. But the really big conflicts, when somebody has done something truly horrible and refuses to repent, when someone is damaging the unity of the church, when someone is involved in just gross sexual sin and refuses to change, that's when church discipline comes in. And conflict is inevitable in every relationship, and so it's going to sneak into the church too. And even though we're saved by grace, we are still in the flesh and we're still struggling against temptation and, and sin. And so, Jesus gives us a clear pattern for how we should deal with things like this. Matthew 18, 15 through 18 is the clearest. He gives us a, a simple process. It says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. 
between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he gives us a process here. And here's what that process looks like. Number one, if another church member or another Christian sins against you or you find out about some unrepentant sin in their life, first you talk to them one-on-one. One-on-one. Sometimes this step needs to be repeated several times with time and space in between each conversation because the point is that they would repent. And if they repent, the process ends right there and forgiveness and restoration begin. But, number two, if they still will not repent, take one or two other church members or other Christians and talk with them. So if they still will not repent, take one or two others to go and talk to them. That's what Jesus says. And like step one, sometimes this step needs to be repeated several times with time and space in between each conversation. Because again, remember, the goal of church discipline is repentance and change and godliness. It's not punishment. It's not retribution. It's not a criminal justice system. But if they repent at that point and they realize that, okay, other people agree with this person too, they're showing me scripture, I am wrong. I need to, I need to repent. I need to give this over to Christ. Then step three, if they still will not repent, bring it to a pastor. Bring it to a pastor. This is a bridge between steps two and four that extends the one or two others and begins to include the whole church. And then step four, if they still will not repent, then we bring it to the whole church, to the whole church. And that would look like this, basically. After reaching out to that unrepentant individual for a final time, the matter would be brought up at the next member's meeting. That matter would be explained in only as much detail as necessary, and the members present would then move to rebuke the individual, and if necessary, to remove them from membership if they won't repent. And then that decision would be communicated to the individual by a pastor of the church, and if pastors can't get a hold of them, then by an official church letter. And again, that's that's something we never want to do. We never want to get to that point. Praise God, we haven't gotten to that point yet. We're a small church. We haven't had to deal with something like that. But it is the, the pattern and it is the command of Jesus given to us in Scripture. Here's another example of this church discipline from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 5, 1-13 says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant shouldn't you rather mourn let him who's done this be removed from among you for though absent in body i'm present in spirit and as if present i have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing when you are assembled in the name of the lord jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. We can go on there, but that's, that's enough for you to see that this is not an isolated thing just found in Matthew 18. We have this example in 1 Corinthians 5, and there are other examples of people being cast out of churches as well. 1 Timothy 1, we see Hymenaeus and Alexander who have been removed because of their blasphemy. And there are others as well. Which points us to step five. If they still will not repent, they'll be removed from membership. And they will no longer be a member of the church. And church members will be instructed not to have close fellowship with that person until they repent. And again, that's based on scripture. He says, I warned you, I wrote to you not to associate with sexually more people. Not meaning the people of the world. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So that if somebody is living this gross, Christian, unchristian lifestyle of unrepentance and sin, then they'll be removed from the church if they won't repent. Here's some things to keep in mind about church discipline. And this is really important too, because this may be totally foreign to some people watching this. Some things to keep in mind about church discipline. Number one, Jesus commands it. Jesus commands it. This is not something we made up. Jesus himself told us to do this, as we read in Matthew 18. 
Number two, this is intended only for serious and damaging sins. It is intended only for serious and damaging sins. Sometimes the best thing to do is just to overlook and forgive an offense in the spirit of 1 Peter 4, 8, which says that love covers a multitude of sins. And sometimes we give leeway for one another's consciences and recognize that, you know, we're still stuck in bodies of sin, that we're like daily striving to be better than we were yesterday. And so this is not for, this is not for little things. And it's not for judgment calls really either. This is not for things where, you know, we can make a strong case one way or the other from scripture. This is for the serious and damaging sins, the stuff that he lists there, sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, um, reviling, drunkenness. Like these are, these are things that are obvious, blatant, and soul-destroying and church-destroying sins. Here's number three. The purpose is restoration, not punishment. The purpose is restoration and not punishment. Like we want the person in unrepentant sin to repent, and to live in a way that honors God. So we put this loving, social, church-wide pressure on them, if need be, saying, look, we all agree this is what the Bible says, and yet you're choosing to do this sinful, horrible thing anyway. And so with by casting them out of the church, the hope is that if that person, that that person will come to come to true faith and come to repentance and and be healed and walk away from that horrible sin. Here's number four. It's good for the church. We do this because it's good for the church. It's good for the church. Church discipline keeps the church pure. It keeps the church pure. If the church is full of members who live crazy, sinful, mean lives, then our ability to represent Christ is damaged, and our witness as a church is ruined. And so, it's good for the church. And then number five. There's not a blank on this one because I don't want there to be any confusion. Sometimes... And particularly if a person has injured or threatened you or somebody else, you may need to go to a pastor directly or even to the police. The process of church discipline is meant as a way of solving conflict and holding people accountable for godly living. It is not intended to be a criminal justice system. God gave us the government for that. If the church doesn't bear the sword, we just have the ability to remove people from membership. And we can put social pressure and spiritual pressure on people to repent. But we aren't executing people. We're not putting people in prison. That's that's the government's job, according to Romans 13. So those are three of our practices that set us apart, I think, and, and are important to understand if you're going to be a member of our church. We baptize only believers, and we baptize by immersion. We take the Lord's Supper pretty regularly. We use bread and grape juice. We recognize that it is a symbol and a reminder and a spiritual blessing for us. It's not the real body and blood of Christ, but it is something that blesses us. And then lastly, we practice church discipline as a means of keeping God's church pure and of holding one another accountable.